very much for uh, joining us in our, in our nice new chambers here uh, for our uh, lecture this evening um, on the, uh, the Victorian Charter of uh, Rights and Responsibilities and the implications uh, of the, uh, the case of uh, Monsilovich. Um, and of course, in the um, in the sense of the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. We live in very, very interesting times for the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities because in just a few short weeks, uh, we've seen both the High Court uh, hand down its, uh, its decision here, which, as you can see, is uh, not, not a concise beast. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate to have a couple of people um, who are very well versed on the topic um, take us through the decision uh, tonight and um, all the ins and outs um, of the decision and its uh, its implications. Um, but of course, in the, in the same uh, period of time, we also saw the, uh, the report from the Victorian Parliamentary Committee, the, uh, the Scrutiny uh, of uh, Legislation uh, Committee, uh, which by, uh, by a party line uh, majority of the uh, coalition members recommended to do away with those parts of the, um, of the Charter, which are actually operative, so um, to not to repeal the whole thing, but to, but to substantially uh, gut it. Um, so um, it will be, uh, as I say, interesting times. Um, before I introduce our, our speakers tonight, um, I should start by introducing myself. I apologise for that. My name is Adam McBeth. I'm one of the deputy directors of the Cassidy Centre for Human Rights Law. Well. Um, I'm directed to uh, to give one other um, very important announcement, depending on the perspective of things. Uh, which is that we will be tweeting um, this particular um, event, the hashtag and the, uh, and the Wi-Fi logging information over there if you're someone who likes to follow such things um, in the course of the night. Uh, if, like me, you're a conscientious objector to Twitter, feel free to handwrite your own notes, and if you want to, you're allowed to use more than 140 characters to do so. Um, so tonight we have um, two, as I say, um, experts on the topic where um, we'd like to have them. Uh, first of all, we have... Uh, uh, Dr. Julie Devilljack, uh, another one of the deputy directors of the Caston Centre. Uh, she's our in-house expert um, on uh, Victorian Charter and on bills of rights, um, bills of rights uh, in general. Um, and when she's not commenting on uh, bills of rights and, uh, and Victorian charters, um, Julie is uh, a chief investigator on uh, two uh, major research uh, grants concerning uh, trafficking in peoples and also um, human rights in closed environments. Um, the latter of which has very significant um, charter implications. Um, following uh, Julie's presentation, uh, we'll be hearing from Associate Professor Joan Stelios from the uh, ANU College of Law. Um, he's a, an expert in public law and in particular in, uh, in uh, an expert on the Constitution and Chapter 3 of the Constitution, um, having uh, published uh, a, a book quite recently uh, called The Federal Judicature, Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Um, and before joining the ANU, uh, James uh, was uh, uh, a legal practitioner, including time as counsel assisting the Solicitor General for the Commonwealth. Uh, so uh, we'll have, as I said, we'll hear from each of our, our speakers in turn, and then uh, at the end of hearing from uh, both of our speakers, there will be uh, an opportunity for questions, and we'll have a couple of uh, a roving microphone uh, for you to ask some questions. Um, so, um, I'd like to join in uh, welcoming Dr. Julie Devilljack. Thank you, Adam. Um, I've just had the word handed at conference to do with um, Albuism. My two sons are, um, have Albuism, and um, it was rather evangelical, actually, but very nice environment, very different to this kind of gathering. So. Um, with my professional hat back on again rather than my um, professional hat back on in public situations. Anyway, thank you, Adam, for your kind introduction. I've been asked today to provide background to the Monsilovich decision and then to examine the case in terms of its implications for the Victorian Charter. And I'm going to speak most particularly about uh, Section 32, the interpretation provision, and also Section 7, the limitations provision, which I think is intimately linked with Section 32. James will then consider the broader constitutional law issues, including the validity of Section 36, um, that's the Declaration of Inconsistent Interpretation Provision, and the Section 109 Inconsistency Issues. I must acknowledge that tonight's um, seminar is actually a repeat of the conference session that James and I participated in on Saturday the 10th of September. Now that day is very important because it was less than 48 hours after the High Court handed down their 273-page decision. The Tarpa conference presentation at that conference was 
uh, um, Momsilovich versus the Queen, from definite pessimism to cautious optimism in 273 pages. And um, I maintain that title, um, or the sentiment of that title tonight. So these papers were originally presented at the Public Law Weekend, um, an annual conference run by the Centre for International and Public Law at the ANU in Canberra. I promised Kim I'll give a plug for her wonderful weekend. Um, but moving straight into my paper now, in terms of the background, um, I'll begin with the facts of the case. So essentially, we had... Okay, essentially, the case concerned the rights compatibility of a classic reverse lease provision in the Drugs Act. Under Section 5, a substance is deemed to be in possession of a person unless the person satisfies the court to the contrary. Under the pre-charter interpretation principles, Section 5 was considered to impose a legal burden of disproving possession on the balance of probabilities. A failure to discharge that reverse burden had very serious consequences, as in the case at hand, because a person may be exposed to conviction for drug trafficking under Section 73 sub 2, when read with Section 71 AC of the Drugs Act, and this is an offence punishable by up to 15 years imprisonment. The Court of Appeal had to consider firstly whether this reverse legal burden under Section 5 imposed an unjustifiable limit on Bureau von Silich's right to the presumption of innocence under the Charter. If it did, the Court secondly had to consider whether the right's incompatibility could be remedied through interpretation under Section 32.1. And that provision provides, as you can see on the PowerPoint, so far as it is possible to do so consistently with their purpose, all statutory provisions must be interpreted in a way that is compatible with human rights. It was argued by three of the four parties and the amicus curiae of the case that Section 5 should be interpreted as imposing only an evidentiary onus on the accused, and that would ensure rights compatibility of that provision. If this interpretation was not available under Section 32.1, oh then thirdly, the Court of Appeal had to consider whether to issue a declaration of inconsistent interpretation under Section 36 of the Charter. So this essentially became a test case on the strength of Section 32 and the appropriate method methodology under, under the Charter. So what were the choices before the Court of Appeal? I'm going to first consider the strength of Section 32.1. In my opinion, Section 32.1 was modelled on Section 3.1 of the UK Human Rights Act. Section 3 is on the PowerPoint, and you can read it, it provides, so far as it is possible to do so, legislation must be read and given effect in a way which is compatible with convention rights. The similarity between Section 32 of the Charter and Section 3 is striking, as you can see in the PowerPoint, relevantly the only difference being that 32 adds the words consistently with their purpose. By way of contrast, Section 6 of the Bill of Rights of New Zealand reads, Whenever an enactment can be given a meaning that is consistent with the rights and freedoms contained in this Bill of Rights, that meaning shall be preferred to any other meaning. Now, whether or not Section 6 of the, uh, of the New Zealand Bill and Section 3 of the UK um, Act achieve a similar outcome is highly contested. But regardless, in my opinion, our Section 32 is clearly modelled on Section 3 as opposed to Section 6. For the purposes of today's discussion, the British jurisprudence on Section 3 is of three categories. The earliest of the cases um, was RBA, and that's considered the high watermark of the interpretation of Section 3, with one commentator considering that um, Section 3 really was, quote, interpretation being more in the nature of delete all and replace amendment, unquote. The middle ground is represented by the case of Gaydar. Although Gaydon is considered a retreat from RBA, its approach to Section 3 is still considered quite radical because of Lord Nichols' open comments about the rights compatible purposes of the Human Rights Act potentially being capable of overriding rights incompatible purposes of any particular law. It's questionable whether the open comments of Lord Nichols are in truth that radical, and I address this in a public law review article that I'll refer to um, later. The third um, narrowest interpretation, if you like, of Section 3 was proposed by Lord Hoffman in the Wilkinson case. Lord Hoffman draws an analogy between Section 3 and the principle of legality. 
Wilkinson has failed to materialise as a leading case on Section 3 in the UK. Rather, Galen remains the case that is um, most relied upon. So that's the question about the strength. What about methodology? Another issue to, to be decided was the appropriate methodology to be used under the Charter. Under the two most relevant comparative instruments, the UK Human Rights Act and the New Zealand Bill of Rights, the methodology adopted is similar and by and large settled. Indeed, three justices at the Supreme Court of Victoria had already essentially adopted the approach in the UK um, in the decisions of RJE, that was Bell, um, Crack, oh sorry, RJE was Nettles, um, I beg your pardon, um, the decision of Crack, which was um, Justice Bell, and the decision of Das, which was Chief Justice Warren. This method focuses on two classic rights questions and two charter questions, and I summarise it um, in charter language as follows. Oh, well, it's going to come out slowly. I'll get it all up at once. So firstly, in terms of the rights questions, firstly, does the legislative provision limit a right? Secondly, if it does, is that limitation justifiable under Section 7.2? Moving on to the charter questions, if the provision imposes an unjustifiable limitation on rights, interpreters must consider whether that provision can be saved through Section 22 interpretation. So accordingly, a judge or interpreter must alter the meaning of the provision in order to achieve rights compatibility. Then fourthly, the judge must decide whether the altered interpretation of the provision is possible and consistent with statutory purpose. At the end of this four-step approach, if you like, um, we can draw some conclusions. Firstly, if Section, if the section 31, sorry, 32 rights compatible interpretation is possible and is consistent, this is a complete remedy to the human rights issue. You've got a rights consistent interpretation. Alternatively, if the Section 32 rights compatible interpretation is not possible and or not consistent, the only option is a declaration under Section 36. I'm going to refer to this as a New Zealand slash UK model, and this is the model that I prefer. So what did the Court of Appeal decide? Essentially, the Court of Appeal eschewed um, the early Victorian authority and the RBA and the Gaydown approaches and chose to align its judgment most closely with the Wilkinson approach. Um, essentially, the Court of Appeal unanimously held that Section 32 does not create a special rule of interpretation in the Gaydown sense, but rather forms part of the body's interpretive rules to be applied at the outset in ascertaining meaning of the provision in question. The framework of interpretive rules includes, firstly, Section 32 of the Charter, secondly, Section 35A of the Interpretation Legislation Act, and thirdly, the common laws of um, statutory interpretation, particularly the principle of legality. For the Court of Appeal, the significance of Section 32 was that Parliament embraced, affirmed and codified the principle of legality. The Court of Appeal also outlined a three-step methodology, which differs from the UK approach. Step one, as per the PowerPoint, um, the interpreter is to ascertain the meaning of a provision by applying Section 32.1 in conjunction with the common law principles of statutory interpretation and the Interpretation Legislation Act. Step two, you only then consider whether, so interpreted, the provision breaches a human right. And then step three, if it does breach a human right, you apply Section 7.2 to determine whether the limit imposed on the right is justified. So the main differences in these two approaches um, can be very briefly summarised um, as follows. Under the Court of Appeal method, Section 32 is relevant at the outset, and Section 72 is not relevant to interpretation at all. Section 32 is a step preparatory to making a Section 36 declaration. This is in contrast to the New Zealand UK model, which uses ordinary interpretive methods to establish whether a right is limited. It then uses Section 7 to decide whether the limit is justified. And then, only then, is Section 32 used after an unjustified limitation is established, with Section 32 actually being used as part of a remedial power to address the unjustified limitation. So this very brief comparison highlights the essential question, what is Section 32? Is it simply a rule of ordinary inter interpretation, or 
is it a special rule allowing remedial interpretation of a provision to render it rights compatible? Now, just to finish off the background, oh, I jumped ahead one. <coughs> um, in applying its methodology, the Court of Appeal made the following decision. Firstly, the proper meaning of Section 5, the reverse owners provision, was the imposition of a reverse legal onus. Secondly, um, that the combined effect of Section 5 and Section 71AC is to limit the presumption of innocence. And thirdly, the limitation was not reasonable or demonstrably justified under Section 7. So although a rights compatible interpretation was not available, Section 5 remained valid and enforceable, so the only remedy available was the making of the declaration of Section 36, which the Court of Appeal did. In my opinion, the result of the Court of Appeal decision is a very narrow uh, construction of Section 32 and a rights reductionist methodology, which in turn delivers a very uh, a much weaker rights instrument than I think was intended by Parliament. In terms of critiquing the Court of Appeal decision, um, I've done that uh, in the second stop point there um, in an article in Public Law Review. Um, relevant to today's discussion, um, my main critique is of the, the Court of Appeal's um, rationality or the rationale for classifying Section 32 as a codification of the principle of legality. And I also critique their methodology, particularly their reliance on the dissenting opinion of the Chief Justice Elias in the Hanson decision of New Zealand. Time to not me to canvas these um, arguments today. Suffice to say that the criticisms that I make on those two issues, Section 7's relevance and the principle of legality, um, equally apply to the High Court decisions um, with, that adopt uh, a similar approach. So what did the High Court do? I'll first summarise the decision before um, drilling down into my areas of, of concentration. Um, now, having read through the entire 273 page judgment on numerous occasions now, I must acknowledge that um, my debt to the High Court summary of this decision for this brief summary of their decision. On the Operation Section 5 of the Drugs Act, five judges held that Section 5 did not apply to the offence of trafficking under Section 71 AC. Section 5 spoke about possession. Section 71 AC spoke about possession for sale. So 5 didn't actually apply to Section 71 AC. 71 AC was a composite um, concept, not a singular concept. Because of that, their honours held that Ms. Monsilich's trial had miscarried because the jury had been misdirected. Six judges also held that Section 71 um, AC in the Drugs Act was not invalid for in Section 109 inconsistency under the Commonwealth Constitution, and James will talk about that later. The court quashed Ms. Monsilich's conviction, set aside her sentence, and ordered a new trial to be had. On the charter issues, Six judges held that Section 32 operated as a valid rule of statutory interpretation, which is a function that may be conferred upon courts, but their reasoning differed, and that's what I'll explore in a moment. In relation to Section 36 two declarations, four judges held that they were valid, but there was different reasoning behind that. Of those, two judges, Chief Justice French and Bell, held that there could be no appeal to the High Court from a declaration made under Section 36, and two other justices, Justice Crennan and Keifel, held that a declaration of inconsistent interpretation should not have been made by the Court of Appeal in this particular proceeding. But those four held them to be valid, uh, the, the provision to be valid. Three judges held that Section 36 was an invalid for impermissibly impairing institutional integrity of the Supreme Court. So basically, separation of powers issue under the Commonwealth Constitution. Again, um, an issue that James will address. So now, for the remainder of my talk, I really want to hone in on what the judges said about Section 7, Section 32, and methodology. As noted, six judges upheld Section 32 as a valid rule of um, interpretation, but their reasoning differed, and I need to explore that now. So, let's start with the Chief Justice. In overview, Chief Justice French agrees with Court of Appeal that Section 32 is a codification of the principle of legality, um, and this has implications for Section 7. His honour was silent about the Court of Appeal method, 
but one can assume that he approves of the method given that the method followed from the principle of legality characterization. In terms of Section uh, 7.2 analysis, Chief Justice French accepted the submission put by the Human Rights Law Resource Centre that the Canadian Supreme Court, quote, expressly declined to consider its Section 1 limits provision when interpreting a reverse onus, unquote. Rather, it, quote, applied Section 1 only when considering whether the impugned law should be upheld. So accordingly, in their reasoning, proportionality was argued to not be an interpretive function. I respectfully disagree with this. It's not to the point that the Canadian Supreme Court does not consider Section 1 when interpreting a statute provision. Under the Canadian Charter, the Supreme Court interprets the statute provision according to ordinary principles of interpretation. If a right is engaged, the court then looks at Section 1 limitation provision, that's the equivalent of our Section 7. Then, the court will apply the constitutional remedy of invalidation if a right is unjustifiably limited. This process could be replicated under the Victorian Charter, and I argue that it is so intended to be replicated um, by our Parliament. So it can be replicated if Section 32.1 is characterised as a special remedial interpretive power. That is, under the Victorian Charter, we should interpret Section provisions according to ordinary principles of interpretation, then apply the Section 7.2 limitations provisions, and then apply the Charter Remedy of Section 32 interpretation if a right has been unjustifiably limited. So there's essential disagreement here, or misunderstanding, um, about the role of Section 32. That is, Section 32 should be seen as Victorian Charter Remedy, just as invalidation is seen as a Canadian Charter Remedy. Um, my critique in the Public Law Review article um, that relates to Chief Justice Alliance's reasoning is salient here. Chief Justice French concludes on Section 7.2 um, that he has no role to play in establishing the content of rights and thereby no role to play at all in interpret interpretation of the Section 32. The Chief Justice then goes on um, to accept that Section 32.1 is a codification of the principle of legality relying on the Wilkinson decision. His Honour states, quote, Section 32 applies to the interpretation of statutes in the same way as a principle of legality, but with a wider field of application. The Court of Appeal was essentially correct in its treatment of Section 32. Unquote. In addition to the criticisms in my article about the characterisation of Section 32 being a codification of the principle of legality, I wish to add here that by his honest myopic focus on the words consistent with statutory purpose, he respectfully fails to appreciate the work to be done by the words so far as is possible to do so. At this point, my pessimism about Victorian Charter's future um, began to deepen. Turning to the decisions of um, um, Justices Crenn and Keifel, in overview, this joint judgment considers Section 32 to be an ordinary rule of construction, although their honours do not explicitly go as far as a court of appeal in considering um, it to be a codification of the principle of legality. Their Section 7.2 analysis begins very, very, very well, but then their honours discount Section 2 as it not being applicable because section, the Section 32 interpretation comes first. And finally, their honours reject both the Court of Appeal and the New Zealand slash UK methodologies without substituting a new method. I'll go into more detail now. The Joint Judgment spends a great deal of time attempting to differentiate our Section 7 limitations provision from other general limitations clauses, particularly the Canadian Charter. In my respectful opinion, their honours place much too, emphasis, uh, too much emphasis sorry, on the fact it's listed in Section 7.2 and not enough emphasis on the actual test in Section 7.2. That is, the overarching test is whether a limit is reasonable and demonstrably justified with the factors in paragraph A to E um, really helping to inform that overarching test. Moreover, their honours opinion that the paragraph E least restrictive means test in the Victorian Charter is different to the Canadian as, a, as possible impairment test with respect is astonishingly narrow. In relation to section 32, the honours hold that Section 32, quote, does not state a test of construction 
which differs from the approach ordinarily undertaken by courts towards statutes, unquote. The honours also note the acknowledgement in section 32 sub 3 sub A that a rights compatible interpretation may not be possible in all cases indicates that, quote, it cannot be said that section 32 requires the language of uh, a section to be strained to affect consistency with the charter, unquote. When um, analysing the interaction between section 7 and section 32, my peasants are lifted for a brief moment. In paragraphs 571 and 572 of the joint judgment, the honours correctly acknowledge that on one reading, rights are not absolute, that charter rights have to be read as subject to justifiable limitations, that section 72 has no influence on the interpretation of a statute provision, and that if a limit on a right is justified, that one could conclude that there was compatibility between the provision and the charter. In my opinion, that's all great stuff. But their honours then go on to hold that the inquiry under section 7 does not inform section 32. There is no link between section 7 and section 32 in their honours opinion because, quote, the process referred to in section 32 is clearly one of interpretation in the ordinary way, unquote. Their honest conclusion on section 7 is worth quoting too because, again, I think it's rather astonishing. Quote, it is not possible to read section 7 so that it operates with section 32 or section 36. It is not necessary to determine whether it has any other consequences, although it is difficult to, desert, it is difficult to discern that it might, unquote. With respect, this is another astounding aspect of their honest decision, even from a first principles analysis. As per Pierce and Getty's um, book on statutory interpretation, quote, as a general principle, the courts have pointed out that they are not at liberty to consider any word or sentence as superfluous or insignificant. insignificant. All words must be given some meaning and effect. So I would argue that section 7.2 must be given some meaning and effect. So on my tally so far, we have three judges that accept the court of appeal decision in whole or in part, and in my opinion, these judges are actually the minority on the issue. Turning to the majority uh, decisions. Justice Gummo, uh, with whom Justice Hayne concurs, basically accepts the UK New Zealand method. Up front in his honours um, um, primary conclusions, he's a 13 step primary conclusion at the beginning of his, of his judgment. The scene is set when his honour notes that the structure of the charter in step four. He basically acknowledges that section 7 sits in part 2 with a statement of the rights, while section 32 sits in part 3. So he notes that, quote, part 2 then operates upon the provisions of part 3. And this is very important in my opinion. Um, in placing the charter in comparative context, Justice Gummer considers the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and the Hansen decision of greater comparative utility than the UK Human Rights Act. Um, although I can live with this, I'm not convinced by his honest reasoning for differentiating the UK Human Rights Act. Justice Gummo then puts section 7 and section 32 on par with section 5 and section 6 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, and he accepts the majority methodology from Hansen, which is basically the methodology I've been talking about. His honest states, Section 32 is directed to the interpretation of statute provisions in a way which is compatible with the human rights in question, as identified and described in Part 2, including where they have been engaged under Section 7.2. The relationship between 32 and Section 7 is thus similar to that between Section 5 and Section 6 of the New Zealand Act. So in other words, the rights and limitations under Part 2 are considered first before you then turn to Section B2 um, interpretation under Part 3. Interestingly, in the context of, dis of dismissing um, any separation of usual power issues, Justice Gamo cites the passage from Project Blue Sky, which acknowledges that statutory interpretation, quote, may require the words of a legislative provision to be read in a way that does not correspond with the literal or grammatical meaning, unquote. His honour then states, quote, that reasoning applies a fortiori 
where there is a canon of construction mandated by a specific provision such as Section 32. The next, or the second last decision we need to look at is over Justice Spell. In my opinion, her honour gives the most clear, coherent and concise judgment, and she happens to agree with me. <laughs> in relation to Section 7.2, Justice Spell considers the Court of Appeal approach pays insu insufficient regard to the place of Section 7 in the scheme of the Charter. Her honour then holds that, quote, the rights set out in the succeeding sections of Part 2 are subject to demonstrably justified limits under Section 7, unquote, and, quote, the child's recognition that rights may be reasonably limited and that their exercise may require consideration of the rights of others informs the concept of compatibility with human rights, unquote. Justice Bell then goes on to accept the Victorian Attorney General's submissions that Section 7 is part of the process of determining whether a rights-compatible interpretation exists. Justice Bell then essentially accepts the methodology um, of the UK slash New Zealand, and she describes it in charter language on the PowerPoint, and I'll quote it to you. If the literal or grammatical meaning of a provision appears to a charter right, my step one, the court must consider whether the limitation is demonstrably justified by reference to the Section 7.2 criteria, my step two. If the ordinary meaning of the provision would place an unjustified limit on a human right, the court is required to seek to resolve the apparent conflict between the language of the provision and the mandate of the charter by giving the provision a meaning that is compatible with the human right, my step three. 